So our next presentation is um, by Alihan Huyuk. He's a PhD student who joined our lab in 2019, and it's on quantitative epistemology. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alihan, and as Nick mentioned, I'm a PhD student in Professor Van Lesher's group. Today, I'm going to present you a new research paper in our group called quantitative epistemology. The main purpose of quantitative epistemology is to develop machine learning methods aimed at understanding, supporting, and improving human decision-making. We achieve this by building decision-making models capable of capturing how humans acquire new knowledge, establish and update their beliefs, and act on the basis of their accumulated knowledge. Since, approach, since our approach is driven by observational data and attempts to answer questions concerning knowledge, we call this new research pillar quantitative epistemology. As a motivation for why we might be interested in modeling decision-making behavior, consider the setting of organ transplantations, which Yarun will talk about in much more detail later on. On one hand, we have the current transplantation behavior where clinicians make decisions based on various clinical guidelines and organs are allocated based on different risk scores, such as mild in US and transplant benefit in the UK. And on the other hand, we have behavior which we consider to be ideal, given our current understanding of organ transplantation. Identifying this ideal involves establishing goals we desire to achieve with transplantation, such as maximizing total population life years, and applying conventional methods of behavior planning Organite and OrganSync are examples of such methods developed within our lab. Then a pressing question is, how can we make sure the existing behavior is as close as possible to the ideal we have identified using this machine learning method? How should we update the guidelines we have in order to make practices proposed by methods like Organite and OrganSync more of a reality? And the very first step towards answering this question is to describe the existing behavior itself in a quantitative manner, ideally using the same quantities and measures with which we describe our ideal behavior. In a recent paper called ICB, we have indeed in investigated how the transplantation behavior has been evolving over time, starting from 1996 up to today. Using ICB, we were able to identify how the importance of various factors relevant to liver transplantations has been changing over time. This provides a data-driven way to judge the impact of newly introduced guidelines on clinical practice. For instance, in the figure on screen, we see that the importance of keratinin and INR, which are the factors most heavily weighted in MELD, has increased since the introduction of MELD in 2002, as one would expect but it started to decrease again as more exception points are added to the MELD system later on. Using behavior representations like this, new and improved guidelines can be generated in a more systematic way. Once a new guideline is introduced, say based on a method like Organite, its impact on clinical practice can be assessed using quantitative epistemology. Then adjustments can be made accordingly either to the guideline itself or the models that are used to identify ideal ways to behave. Again, using candidate epistemology to assess the effect of those assessments. Guidelines and the resulting behavior can be kept improving like this in a closed loop. Beyond this particular example of organ transplantation, we introduced the cycle of continuous improvement as a more general framework for modeling decision-making an earlier paper called Inverse Decision Modeling. It is important to distinguish our approach from the existing work in decision-making analysis. Conventional methods almost always focus on constructing autonomous agents that can replace humans, either by imitating their behavior or discovering better ways to act. Instead, with Inverse Decision Modeling, we are concerned with leveraging machine learning to help humans become better decision makers. Overall, we aim to understand and explain decisions, which entails analyzing variation in practice, identifying suboptimal behavior and the causes behind it, and giving quantitative accounts of past behavior, as in ICB, and so on. 
When these are the questions we have focused so far within the IDM framework, the scope of quantitative epistemology as a research pillar goes even further than that. Here's another example, which showcases the potential of uh, quantitative epistemology as an investigative device for auditing and quantifying individual decisions. Interpol, which is the method used to obtain representations in this slide, seeks to model the evolution of an agent's beliefs in relation to their actions. We consider the real-world diagnostic patterns for Alzheimer's disease from the Edna dataset. So each representation here corresponds to a real patient from that dataset. Um, to give a brief background, Alzheimer's progresses in three stages normal function, or NL for short, mild cognitive impairment, or MCI for short, and dementia. In the triangles below, each corner corresponds to one of these three st stable diagnoses. And each point inside the triangles corresponds to the clinician's belief regarding their patient's underlying state at each individual visit to the hospital. The closer a point is to a corner, the higher the probability assigned to that state. As the actions, we consider the decision-making problem of ordering versus not ordering an MRI test, which while often informative of Alzheimer's is financially costly. In the figures, we also plot the decision boundary between these two actions. The first two figures I show, uh, show you typical patients who fit well to the overall learned policy by Interpol. The former is a normal functioning patient believed to remain around the decision boundary in all their visits, except the first, and appropriately, they are ordered an MRI during approximately half of their visits. The latter is believed to be deteriorating from MCI towards dementia, as they are monitored closely by prescribing an MRI in all their visits. This third patient, on the other hand, was ordered an MRI in neither of their first two visits, despite the fact that the typical policy would have strongly recommended one. At the third visit, when an MRI was finally ordered, it led to near certainty of cognitive impairment, but this could have potentially been known 12 months earlier. In fact, among all Edna patients in the data set, 6.5% uh, were subject to this pattern. The fourth patient shows how these representations can be used to quantify the value of a test in terms of its information gate. While the patient was ordered an MRI in all of their visits, it may appear on the surface that the third and final MRIs were kind of redundant, since they had little apparent effect on beliefs. However, this is only true for the factual belief update that occurred according to the MRI outcome that was actually observed. The tests were actually highly informative, since the patient's cognitive test scores were suggestive of impairment at the time, and in the counterfactual, the doctor's beliefs could have potentially led drastically towards MCI if the MRI outcomes were to be different. In this case, MRI was kind of used to eliminate the probability of MCI, basically, which was suggested by this cognitive test results. We evaluated Interpol by consulting nine clinicians from four different countries for feedback, and all nine clinicians preferred the belief trajectories recorded by Interpol or alternative ways of representing how information is accumulated. Moreover, seven out of these nine clinicians prefer to pulse the representation in terms of decision boundaries or an alternative representation based on rewards, which is much more common in decision-making analysis. Here are groups other work within the IDM framework. I have already talked about ICB and Interpol briefly, but besides these two, we have also looked into timeliness in decision-making, new methods to recover reward functions, um, the role of counterfactuals in decision-making using a causal framework, and the concept of bounded rationality. You can check out all these work in our website. Thank you for listening.